So hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, as always, every week, and I've been working with CCF for almost 10 years, almost a decade, folks, to create video content like this, like video, uh, live video series, but also produce video content, all with the same uh, mission, which is to, to raise awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so if you are a regular to the show, you probably are already uh, doing what I always ask. Good morning from Alberta, Canada, from Edmond Edmonton, SoCal. Let us know where you're tuning in from uh, around the world. We'd love to see how far this program reaches. And it astonishes me every, every week to see Elon, North Carolina. Hey, you're right up the road from me. Um, it astonishes, astonishes me every week to see how far uh, this reaches around the globe, especially live, the people who are joining us. Uh, while we're broadcasting, it may be early in the morning, it may be the middle of the night in some countries. So we're very grateful of that. And if you're new to the show, that's your first instruction. Let us know where you are in the world and say hello to everybody. So before we get started, we want to send a very special thank you to, to our sponsors, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this uh, program, Lunch with the Experts, wouldn't be possible. And as always, we want to give a disclaimer from them. So We'd like to let you know that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed in, by the guest and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health and treatments. Okay. So uh, like with many disclaimers, it's a lot of words, but the main message there is that last statement. We're going to give you some good information, hopefully some guidance and direction for your journey today. But by all means, we don't know your specific case. So please talk to your home team who does know your specific case about any ideas that, that you uh, may have after this presentation. Okay, so we're very excited about today's episode. Today's guest is Dr. Durvadur. Half Donerson, did I say that close to <laughs> accurately? <laughs> Half Donerson, uh, Dr. Half Donerson, tell the folks who you are, where you work, what you do, and 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 your role as you see it in the overall neuroendocrine tumor community. Yeah, thank you. Thanks uh, very much for the invitation, and thanks to the sponsors of the program. So my name is uh, Thor Half Donerson, and I am a medical oncologist at Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. So. Uh, trained at Mayo Clinic and the University of Iowa, was at the University of Iowa for several years in the neuroendocrine tumor program there, and then at Mayo in Arizona for a few years, and have been at Mayo in Rochester now for six years. So my interest in neuroendocrine tumors probably began close to 15 years ago when I started doing some research projects on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and then one could say that sort of spun out of control in a good way. And uh, so I just got very fascinated with uh, neurone tumors and uh, was uh, very fortunate to get hooked up with the right mentors at the time. And uh, so now I am one of two medical oncologists at Mayo and Rochester who is dedicated to neurone tumor care, the other one being uh, Dr. Tim Hoffday. And uh, we, as a Mayo, we represent a, uh, essentially three centers, Mayo, uh, Rochester, then we have Florida and Arizona. And we're a fairly large uh, neuron tumor center. So I just uh, ran the numbers uh, recently. So in 2020, we saw more than 2000 individual patients with neuron tumors. And in Rochester alone, we see more than 400 new consultations a year. So, uh, and as it happens with neuron tumors, there is not like one single person who is the program. It's always a team effort. And uh, we're very grateful for having the opportunity to work as a multidisciplinary team at Mayo. So essentially, as a medical oncologist, uh, I can take care of some of the, uh, uh, the or most of the, uh, the uh, systemic therapy or drug uh, treatments, but uh, for surgery and other procedures, imaging and interventional radiology, obviously I have to rely on a large group of, uh, of uh, coworkers. So that's sort of me in, uh, in a nutshell. So I think uh, you didn't come here to, to, to hear about me. We came here to talk about the questions and I'm very eager to start taking questions. See, what a, what a great doctor, folks, that you see right there. It's about you all at home. Love that. No ego involved here. Uh, so welcome, everybody. The numbers are outstanding already, so that's a good sign uh, for, for you, doctor. Your reputation precedes you. Uh, 
Uh, hey, Julia. Julia says good morning from New Orleans. Shout out to her, friend of the foundation, and Oman Chowan, Dr. Chowan, who's also been on the show. Hello, hello. Uh, Thora Mack has some Icelandic for you, uh, <laughs> Dr. Havdanerson, so I'll have to copy and paste that for you because... Um, Unfortunately, that's one of the many languages that I, I don't speak. Um, so for those um, joining us, we are here with Dr. Hef Donerson, and we're going to have a great show for you today. A couple of last things that I like to go over before we get started. Um, we may not get to all of your questions, and so if we don't, please know that um, you can follow up with Carson and Cancer Foundation anytime, or if you have follow-up questions, if we do get to your questions, you can message them here on their Facebook page privately. You can reach them at their website, carsonoid.org. Um, so if we if we don't get to that question, because we always get a lot of questions, our numbers are looking great already. So I suspect that we're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, just know that you can always reach out and they'll give you the information that you're seeking or, or, or guidance to the specialist you should talk to. Um, and also this video will live here. So just know that you can always refer back to it. However, the benefit of this show is this interactive virtual one-on-one -on -one session that you have with our, our expert today. So try to get your questions across. And if you know someone who would benefit from this, this is my first ask from you, tag them in the, in the comments, uh, share this video to their Facebook page, let them know this is going on now so we can get as, as many people here as possible to, to benefit from this. But we will always have the video available for you to refer back to afterwards. Lastly, the second thing I'm going to ask uh, from you, and then you've been doing a great job of this every week, is if you see a question in the comments bar that you also have or you're also interested in learning the answer to, you can upvote that essentially or effectively by liking it or loving it or any of the many reactions that Facebook Facebook gives you the options to choose, but either way, that lets me see that, hey, five people have liked that, that question. There's a demand for it. I'll make sure to get it across. So finally, before we get started, last question, have you downloaded CCF's uh, free Net Cancer Health Storylines app? This app makes it very easy for you to record your symptoms, medications, nutritional concerns, moods, and so much more. So if you haven't, check it out. We will put a link in the comments section. So that being said, let's get the show started. Dr. Half Donerson, you said something um, when you about when you first started working with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which was, as you said, about 15 years ago, correct? Mm -hmm. And you said something along the lines of, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's this sentiment has been shared before, which is why it interests me. I don't know if you said challenges or some unique things about it, but it, it seems like that was the takeaway. What what was that initial interest in this disease when you started seeing it? Was it that it was completely unique to what you'd seen before? Was it that it presented a challenge for you? What was that first draw of your interest, if you can, if you can recall? Sure, no, so that's a, that's a great question. So, so a couple of things. So obviously very fascinating uh, disease in the way that it can present with symptoms even years before you can find the actual uh, diagnosis. And uh, probably what interests me the most when I started looking at this was how little sort of uh, little was known about the treatment. There was a lot known about pathology and the role of surgery. But at that time, and we're talking probably 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. there wasn't really a lot of quality research in terms of uh, therapy, and uh, and we didn't have we didn't even have a good, very firm idea about how common these tumors were. So I just walked into this in a clinic one day, and uh, said, "Here's a tumor that I've heard about since medical school, but uh, and I've known very little about." And then I found out that pretty much everyone ar around me knows as little as I do. Right. So, uh, so they, for me, coming, and I freely admit that at that time I was not particularly interested in research. So this sort of just seemed like the ideal uh, situation to study, and I just got so fascinated by it that uh, that that lasts till till this day. That's awesome. You know, I find that's a common thread from, from the, the doctors who work primarily or specifically with this disease at some point in their career, they were that, 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 that little thing, not little thing, that big thing is, is what challenged them and what piqued their interest in pursuing this is, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for them. And, you know, some people like a, like a challenge like that. And I think since that point, in 2003 or so, we've seen tremendous strides, which also has that same group of experts and doctors very excited about 
the potential future that we have with this disease. So I, I, I'm always curious to, 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 to learn the stories of what, what drew someone to this disease specifically, but I agree from what I've learned, a lot of people have that same feeling of not knowing much about you know, how we approach this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and we have already got a lot of great questions coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and pivot to that. Um, but we do have a top fan of the foundation, Sherry, who says, I met you in Minneapolis at a net conference a few years ago. I was a patient at Mayo. And at that point, you told me about an upcoming study regarding Dipnec. And this is a quite, we get a lot of questions about Dipnec. So I'm, I'm glad Sherry asked this. Has that Dipnec study, if you recall the one she's referring to, uh, between Mayo and two other hospitals, has that been completed? And if so, can we access the results? Any, any thoughts or knowledge on that? Absolutely. So, so that study probably refers to a, a collaborative project we had with Moffitt in Tampa and with the Hadassah University in Jerusalem in Israel. So we looked at the, uh, a fairly large cohort of patients with Dipnex, and the question was, do somatostatin analogs, lanreotide and octreotide, improve symptoms of shortness of breath and coughing and things like that? Mm -hmm. And we found that actually they, they do. And this was published just a few months ago. So this oh, is wow. in, a, in a, one of the, uh, the, uh, the lung scientific journals called CHEST. So this paper is there. But then as it happens, this uh, sort of uh, uh, morphed into a few other projects. So including a project led by Dr. Dan Almquist at Mayo in Arizona, who looked to see how often the step neck progress into more aggressive neurons and tumors. And, and that doesn't happen that frequently. And then the third project was that we started looking at uh, how the dip necks actually look on lung function testing. And all th three papers were published in the last year. So the fourth thing, which sadly has not yet materialized, is that we had an idea of a clinical trial of lanreotype in patients with dip neck looking at lung function and symptoms. And we just haven't found a home for that trial or the support that we need to get it off the ground. But it's, the idea is alive. It's, uh, it's hopefully will uh, eventually be a trial. But lots of interest in, dip, in dip neck. We're understanding it a lot better. So much said analogs seem to help with symptoms. That is great to hear. Great question, Sherry. I appreciate that. Uh, um, and yes, dip neck is an issue that we talk about a lot. And for those at home, we have a video that we released, one of our produced videos this year, uh, which was a treatment-based series on lung nets and, and, and dip neck. Dr. Haftanerson, do you do you deal with uh, lung nerve endocrine tumors often or, or how familiar Absolutely. are you? Okay. So we have, so it's interesting that at Mayo, a lot of the lung nerve endocrine tumors go to the lung cancer group. And we have a- right. A cohort, like, a, like a few physicians there who are particularly interested in neuron tumors. They may not see neuron tumors below the diaphragm, but we have a, a, a few oncologists um, with particular interest in, in, in uh, lung and nets, including Dr. Levan Takos and Dr. Molina. So we actually have that, that group there that, is, that, that doesn't treat neuron tumors outside of the lungs, but they are very enthusiastic about treating them within the lungs. We're doing a couple of different projects right now. Interesting. Okay. Cause if I understand correctly, like that path may be, I don't know if people have different opinions or, or you know, uh, different hospitals have different approaches, but whether to treat them in the lung cancer category or the neuroendocrine tumor category, is that up for debate? Is that, does everyone do it the same way? They don't. So here right, is okay. my take on this. Uh, I don't think it matters necessarily which clinic they go to as long as the person seeing the patient is enthusiastic about that disease. Love it. So, and some of these people live in the lung clinic and then they may be the best, the persons for it. And uh, so I think it's, I think it's fair to ask if you go to a lung cancer clinic with a neuroendocrine problem to ask your provider, is this uh, something that uh, you have expertise in? Is this something that is of interest to you? And sometimes you will find outstanding neuroendocrine providers in a lung clinic. And these may not be people you necessarily know about. Great, that's great information. Sherry, awesome question to kick us off and that spawned off a few other things. Last question for that, that journal chest, is that what you said? Is that available to the public? I do not think that is okay. available. So, but I will have to check. Is there somewhere publicly that someone like Sherry could access the results of the, that study? Yeah, let me look into it. And, okay. uh, and uh, so journals tend to be a little 
careful with what they they share unfortunately sure. in a perfect world i think all medical information should be available to everyone at any given time but that's just not the environment we live in there yeah okay sherry we'll try to get back to you about that and find find out uh, how you can get that but again thank you for your question great question uh next question from gene is the cu or copper gallium scanned uh better than the gallium 68 excellent question from gene there so i'd say not necessarily better so so the results are somewhat uh, sort of uh, mixed so it may pick up slightly higher number of lesions but whether that really makes any difference is not known so the difference with copper 64 is that the half-life of the copper 64 is 12 hours mm -hmm. so you can actually get the copper 64 to pretty much any location in the, the uh, in the lower 48 and uh, to get so, uh, to get people the, the scan they need gallium 68 has a half-life of about 60 minutes so the time it takes would take me to get gallium 68 from Minneapolis to Rochester when it gets to me it's almost dead and they uh, so that's why we make our own and um, so copper 64 is not necessarily better but it will hopefully increase the availability of pet dorotate pet imaging to a lot more people so it's a great addition I am very enthusiastic about it Great. Awesome. Thanks for your question, Gene. Gene representing North Carolina, of course. Uh, next question from John or Vaughn. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Probably not. But he says, what factors should be considered when deciding to take the wait and see approach for a newly diagnosed net patient? That is an outstanding question. Okay. So, uh, so here's what I look at. So I look at the tumor grade. So if the tumor is a, a grade one or a low grade two, so let's say case it's seven less than, than a five or 10%, small volume disease, so not large metastases and minimal symptoms, I think we can wait. We, sometimes we can wait for a long time. Mm -hmm. And to keep in mind the study that got the Landreotype approved, this was a placebo controlled study. So half of the patients got placebo in effective drug. And then it took them on average 18 months to grow, the placebo people. So a lot of them you can actually observe and just obviously hard to draw conclusions from single cases, but I remember very vividly a patient I saw many years ago with liver metastases, fairly sizable, but low grade. And he didn't want shots. It was just, uh, wasn't convenient for him to go in and get shots. He looked quite a ways away. And he said, let's just wait. We waited like three years, didn't do anything. And so ask your pro provider about it. Great amount of tumor symptoms are really the things we think the most about. Long answer, sorry. No, 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 that's great. Thorough, thorough answer. And I appreciate it. And all your answers have been really, really great and easy to understand, which is key. So we appreciate you for that. Folks, if you are just joining us or joined us late, welcome to Lunch with the Experts with this week's guest, Dr. Thor Uh, We're having great questions, great conversations already. So go ahead and send your questions across. Uh, if you have them, and if you know someone else that would benefit from this, another patient, a caregiver, um, anyone in the community, go ahead and you can tag them in the comments or you can share this video and get, get some more folks here, but the numbers are looking great. So that's always exciting to us. Um, okay, next question, doctor from Linda. Linda says, do you have any opinion? And Linda, I know that he does, uh, <laughs> or information regarding the RETNET trial and the use of chemoembolization with DEB for liver carcinoid tumors? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question, Linda. So it's a, so the RETNET study, which I was not involved in, it looked at several different ways to treat liver metastases with embolization. So I haven't seen the final results and I'm not sure if they've been published, but some of the safety results have been published. So if I recall right, they were comparing three different types of liver embolization. So uh, uh, drug eluding beads or DEB, radio embolization and bland embolization. And what we know is that the drug eluding beads resulted in more complications, more liver infections, abscesses. So that arm I think has been stopped. So that actually brings us to the greater question. We have chemoembolization, radioembolization, and bland embolization for liver metastases. Is one modality superior to another? That is not known. Hmm. At Mayo, we do uh, bland embolization almost exclusively. And, uh, and we, when I was at the University of Iowa, we studied this and we found no difference in these modalities. And it was a small study. Uh, so 
And with radio embolization, you just got to be a little careful with how much of the liver you'll embolize, especially if you're going to get PRRT later, which will also expose you to radiation. So we would be a little worried that at the end of the day, the liver would just see too much radiation. And so all three work and think that different cytomax profiles, but I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Got it. Thank you. And thanks for your question, Linda. Doctor, I told you that our... Uh... Our friends at the foundation are, are well educated and they, they ask great thought provoking questions. <laughs> I will throw this in here. This is actually one of the reasons I really enjoy taking care of patients with neuron tumors because they are exceptionally well informed. Mm -hmm. So which actually can really help us discussing very difficult concepts. And so and thanks to the Carson Cancer Foundation and others for providing this education. And I think it's crucial for them, right? Because the issues that we talked about already that are challenging about this disease, uh, there is no one path, you know, or, or typical path where, you know, maybe in other diseases, other cancers, it's like, okay, well, this is primarily what happens. This is primarily the path that we will take to, to solve it, but it's, it's so all over the place. It's, you know, they understand, I think that it's in their best interest to be as educated as possible. That's part of our, you know, yeah. big part of our mission here at the foundation. And yeah, I see that too with the community members. They they don't play. They do their work. They do their research. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question from Gene. Is there a link? And several people have this question, I see. Is there a link between celiac disease and NETS that you know about? Yeah. So Gene, that's a good question. So I don't know the answer to that. So there have been a few studies so probably the countries best equipped to answer these questions are the Scandinavian countries that have large centralized database because they have, everyone is on the same sort of government insurance and the Swedes have actually been doing this. And if there is an association, it's pretty weak. So, so there have been some really neat studies coming out of Sweden uh, recently, no strong association with celiac disease that I, I'm aware of. Keep in mind that with everything, these things can change. So right now, no, I, I, I think it's it's a weak link, but uh, yeah. Got it. Okay, <clears throat> from Sheila, what are the ways to, what are ways to control hypertensive uh, hyperglycemic crises? Um, and then she says, how can very high blood glucose levels be controlled when a PNET patient has um, Hyper, hypertensive, hyper, uh, hyperglycemic crises uh, in response to injectable insulins. Yeah, so this, uh, okay. so that's a, so a, it's a good question, Sheila. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, situation, though. So the uh, the hyperglycemia as a result of the tumor itself, so high blood sugar, mm -hmm. is pretty uncommon. Low okay. blood sugar, obviously, very common with insulinoma. And uh, but the, the high blood sugar we see in neurotumor patients is mostly due to the somatostatin analogs, to the octreotide and lanreotide. And once you're persistently in the high range above 150, 200, we essentially treat that like we would treat any diabetes, typically with oral medications and eventually insulin. So, uh, so that would be uh, typically our main concern. Very, very few neurotumor tumors cause the blood sugar to go up. So it's much, much, much more likely the treatment that does it than the actual tumor. Mm -hmm. As for the blood pressure, probably the most common thing for high blood pressure is fluctuations in blood pressure in people who are already hypertensive, so already have high blood pressure. But rarely neurant tumors can secrete or release chemicals that cause the blood pressure to go up. So you just have to be... Uh, aware of that, treat the blood pressure with blood pressure medications. If you think it's a tumor that's making chemicals that cause this, treat the tumor with the appropriate treatment. This could be embolization or, or drug therapy or combination thereof. Got it, thank you. Uh, got a message from Dr. Robert Ramirez. Says, hi, Rain and Thor, greetings from Nashville, my new home. Dr. Ramirez is a friend of the foundation, was actually in that lung, lung nets video. He was featured in that lung nets video that I mentioned earlier. And yeah, Dr. Ramirez, I saw that Nashville is your, your new home. You just happen to have a way of, of living in awesome cities, it seems. <laughs> Moving from New Orleans to Nashville, it's like pretty, pretty, pretty good move, I think. Um, so we have a kind of a statement, a question from Bruce. It says, I, I I exhausted all chemo oral meds due to metastasis. Now I'm on immunotherapy. Are, are, are your thoughts, is there anything else that Bruce should be thinking about uh, in terms of treatment? 
Well, so the, the first thing I do when people come to the clinic with that uh, problem is that I want to take a look at all of the medications, what was done, and why was it stopped? Was it stopped because of tumor growing? Was it stopped because of side effects? If stopped because of side effects, could we get back on that at a lower dose? Then I would look at the trials. So I would look at the uh, and PRT retreatment I would look at. And so there's a number of things that we could explore. And uh, occasionally we see people who come in with refractory tumors that can still be embolized or radiated. So there's a lot of different things that uh, they're asked for. Immunotherapy hasn't turned out to be as exciting for NETS as it is for most for many other cancers. Hmm. But it, I think we just need to know what to combine immunotherapy with. Immunotherapy alone is not going to be the solution for the vast majority of uh, NET patients. But in combination with other drugs, perhaps, and those trials, I think, we'll see soon. But for a case like this, a careful review of the record, what's been done, why was it changed, is usually the start. Yeah, I think that point about why did, why was that treatment or medication stopped is is, is a really yeah. uh, a really good point to mention. I think that's that's wise and, and may be overlooked sometimes. So yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Christopher says, what's the latest and greatest on how to treat liver nets long-term? Any, anything that's uh, coming up or anything that has recently been released? That's a good, really good question from Christopher there. And, uh, and so in terms of, so when I see someone with liver uh, tumors, I wanna know number one, how much of the liver? And then I wanna know what's going on outside of the liver. Because if there's a lot of activity outside of the liver, the liver may not need to be treated specifically. Mm -hmm. So uh, we at Mayo, we are very much for aggressive surgery. So debulking the liver, we know we're never going to get all of these tumors out. Because you may know this, that after liver surgery, most patients probably have tiny little islands of tumors throughout the liver. But we could set back the clock maybe by many, many years by taking out as much liver tumor as we can. So we should do embolization. And I'm a little worried that uh, with all of the fancy new things like PRT and such, that we forget that liver embolizations actually work really well. I saw a patient today referred to me for PRRT, who seems to be an ideal candidate for liver embolization. And um, so I think you just need to take a look at it. And we need sort of the holistic, comprehensive evaluation with radiology, surgery, nuclear medicine, medical oncology, and then we'll make a decision. And keep in mind, one size does not fit all in neuroendocrinoids. Yes, yes, plus one that. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Great question. And for everybody watching at home, just an FYI, uh, we have our fearless leader, Grace Goldstein, on the back end, uh, adding the resources that Dr. Half Donerson mentions uh, in the links or in the comments, rather, as links, so you don't have to run off and open a new browser window and try to search for them. So that includes the RetNet test that we mentioned. And I believe it was Sherry who asked about DipNEC uh, <laughs> studies and the chest uh, article. So that link is also also in the comments. Thanks to Grace Goldstein for uh, for adding those, making this such a complete experience for lunch with the experts. Um, so Sherry, actually, I think this was the Sherry from earlier, asked a question. Is it common to develop type 2 diabetes following a, a diagnosis of NETS? Have you ever heard of that, doctor? Absolutely. This is a, actually, this is a particular interest of mine. Oh, right. Let's so, uh, so we know for pancreatic NETS, and we did this study at Mayo a few years ago, we looked at patients with pancreatic NETS and compared them to patients who came to Mayo for just a general medical checkup. And the patients who were diagnosed with pancreatic nets were much more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes in the two years prior to the diagnosis of the net. We've known this for pancreatic adenocarcinoma for a long time, but this was relatively new for pancreatic nets. And this has now been confirmed by other studies in other countries. So this seems to be a real thing. So, the, so that would be one thing. A diabetes can be a first sign of a Low, often localized pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, mm -hmm. but much more commonly is uh, diabetes as a consequence of therapy, most typically injection therapy like glandriotide, drug triotide, or everolimus. So people who are inching towards uh, type 2 diabetes, sometimes starting octreotide to glandriotide will sort of push them off the edge. Same with, uh, with, uh, with everolimus. So I'd say nine out of 10 diabetes cases in neurotumor patients are probably as a result of the therapy, not the tumor itself. 
Wow, interesting. That's a great bit of information. And Sherry, great question. That's twice now. You're you're two for two, Sherry, for for great questions, kicking off nice conversations. Another question from Christopher. Do you have suggestions to manage a narrowed small intestine from surgery beyond a low fiber diet? That's, yeah, that's a good question. And I, uh... I don't have a good solution to that. So the thing, if it's very symptomatic, we have occasionally had to do repeat surgery. Sometimes there is just a narrowing at the suture line where they put things back together. So sometimes you just have to remove that piece. Otherwise it's low fiber, low residue diet, and just try to keep the stools as soft as possible, sometimes with laxatives. So this is where I actually ask gastroenterology to help me because occasionally we find that what we thought was secondary to a small bowel narrowing is something else. I'm going to tell you one, just one example. Sorry. If, if, no, if, please, if, please. Okay. Stories so, are great. So this was a, a patient who was sent to me uh, a few years ago, actually several years ago, with very high chromogranin and with diarrhea, but no uh, uh, obvious neurotic tumor. That person actually turned out to have ac- acquired fructose intolerance and was on a protein pump inhibitor for gastric, uh, for like for stomach ulcers. Right. And uh, so it turned out to have a stomach ulcer, chromogranin secondary to the proton pump inhibitor and acquired fructose intolerance. And this is, so it never had an neuronal tumor, but look wow. totally like it. Wow. That's wild. So just keep, don't have, don't have your blinders on when you see neuronal tumor patients. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I've heard, heard of that before. Uh, speaking of GI doctors, Tracy says, I have the blood I have the blood work and symptoms that point to carcinoid and vipoma syndrome, but no tumors have been found. So is it best to see a GI doc instead of a net doc until tumors are located? Your thoughts? Tracy, this is a fantastic question. So, uh, and uh, this is a real thing. So this is uh, people with, uh, with symptoms that look very much like uh, neuronal tumors, if the tumors are from the GI tract, diarrhea, things like that, I would start with gastroenterology almost all the time because there are so many other things like celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and sometimes other in- intestinal malignancies, uh, acquired uh, sort of new, uh, like di- digestive issues. And so there's so much else. And even like a rare type of a thyroid cancer called metrial thyroid cancer can present with diarrhea and flushing. So start there. And uh, unfortunately for m- most of us, medical oncologists, we just don't have the bandwidth to see all of these patients because there are so few of us. So I typically don't see patients unless they have a biopsy. So I would start with ga- in that situation with gastroenterology. So that's a very long answer. No, no, no. Long answers. Thorough answers are, are great. That's what we're looking for. Um, so probably the, the best, most thought provoking question that I've seen so far today comes from Kevin, who says, uh, Doctor, do you picture yourself as a dark haired Chris Hemsworth or more like a dashing Hugh Grant? <laughs> oh, man, can I can I can I pass on that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That just killed me, Kevin. Oh, that is the yeah. That was amazing. See, this is why I love uh, my job. I love this show. Our, yeah. our community is amazing and funny. And I'm like all blushing here. I know. <laughs> I see you over there. <laughs> Both are compliments, so you can just flip a coin. Oh, uh, <laughs> Kevin, that was funny. Uh, and yes, Linda, Grace is right on everything for sure, always. Um, so back to the show. Uh, Sarah says, can, and you may have mentioned this when we were talking about embolizations earlier, so forgive me if you did, but Sarah asks, can you do a liver embolization after PRRT? Absolutely. You, okay. That's a good question. You definitely can. Uh, any circumstances that make that a, a, a more you know, likely um, path to follow? So here is where I would be worried, that, uh, like careful with the radio embolization. Again, uh, looking at the total radiation exposure of the liver over time. So uh, you can do embolization before or after PRRT, but just be mindful of the volume of the liver being embolized and what embolization material you're using. This is actually one of the reasons we're staying away from radio embolization. Got it, got it, thank you. Um, So Lori says, uh, she's had two rectal biopsies within three months of each other. um, Colonoscopy and then flex SIG, diagnosed low grade net, but surgeon didn't tattoo. Uh, remaining cells not showing up on gallium 68 PET. 
now what should i should i wait to should should we wait till it grows back so it is visible for surgery did you follow that okay yeah no so that, it's a it's a good there's a good question this okay. is not uncommon and okay. uh, here the question is where do these patients where are they best served mm -hmm. so we're actually going to have most of these patients only seen by gastroenterology at Mayo because we have a, a focus group there that's going to be focusing on this so if the most rectal neuron tumors are low grade and most are very adequately treated just by simple removal of the tumor, sometimes it requires advanced endoscopy. So the endoscopist needs to be a person who is trained in, in sort of uh, endoscopic removal of difficult polyps. So if there is any concern for residual disease and it doesn't show up on gallium 68, keep in mind for a tumor to show up on gallium 68, it has to be probably about five to 10 millimeters. And that's millions of tumor cells. And uh, so I like to do lower, what's called lower EUS, endoscopic ultrasound, endorectal ultrasound in there with a slightly larger scope with an ultrasound probe on the end. And you can sort of look around and scan through the rectum. And, uh, and if there's nothing there, we'll just uh, scan it. We'll just do another flexic in one or two years. Got it. We're actually working on uh, just just uh, we're, we're going to be working on guidelines on how to deal exactly with this through nanets. Awesome, good to know, good to know. Um, Jane says, "What's the smallest size of liver tumors you have embolized? If there are several, more than, like more than thirty. So, Jane, that's a really good uh, good uh, question. So, you can embolize small tumors. The question is, it's really practical to do, and in terms of numbers and uh, so, uh, so you can embolize pretty small tumors, but then the question is, do we really need to do that? Knowing that there are probably dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of little nests of neuron tumors throughout the liver. So in many of those, I like just to watch. We are doing more of, of what's called radio frequency or microwave ablations. So sticking needles through the skin into the liver and burning them one-on-one. -on -one. And then it just, a few weeks ago, the Canadians, so the Toronto group, published their experience with what's called stereotactic body radiation to liver metastases in patients with neuron tumors. That's probably one of the more interesting net papers I've seen in a long time, especially in terms of radiotherapy. So focused radiation therapy, especially like a gamma knife, like sort of sharpshooting radiotherapy, actually works. So we have now more, yet another option in the, yet another tool in the toolbox to deal with the liver. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Um, Dr. Hef Donerson, um, we talked a little bit about PRT or we've kind of, you know, touched on it a little bit today. Could, could we spend a little bit of time on that? What's your view on that as a treatment in terms of, in terms of when, when in the sequence that you might, you might pursue that? Is it vastly different for each patient? Is there, uh, you know, how do you feel like you're the best way to approach that or when would be the best time to approach that rather? great question of and of huge interest and importance to the net community. So, so for small bowel neuron tumors, metastatic advanced, if you have, if the, the cancer is progressing on injection therapy, so much in analogs, and you can't treat it with embolization radiation or something like that, you don't have a lot of good options. You have abrolimus expected to control the disease for about 12 months or thereabout or PRRT, which can control the disease for about three years. So that would be second line therapy uh, in small bowel and maybe lung uh, neurontic tumors. So for pancreatic neurontic tumors, it gets a lot more complicated. So there we have sunetinib and epirolimus and capecitabine temozolomide. And then for both of them, we now have the clinical trial of capoxanthinib, the Alliance cabinet study, which I definitely want people to be aware of. So, uh, and then keep in mind also that for PRRT, there's about two to three percent risk of causing leukemia. So you have to look at the, the pace of the disease. Is it a faster moving disease, more of it where uh, intervention is more urgent or is it a slower growing disease? So uh, where we have other options, there are younger persons who say, well, I know that two to 3% risk of leukemia is low, but it's too high for me. Why don't we exhaust the other options that don't cause leukemia before we get to the PRT? And who knows, maybe we'll have something else. PRT is wonderful. It's by far the most important thing that has happened in therapy of nets since I started doing this. Mm -hmm. We just have to use it carefully and we have to present all of the options and all of the risks. I think like you've already said, it's one tool in the toolbox, 
it is you know yeah. so and and we all we know that each case is different so I think, you know, as anybody knows who's ever built anything or done anything with a toolbox, the more tools you have, the more potential I think you have for success. If you just yeah. have a hammer, yeah. you know, I'm looking at my daughter's play set that I built right now. If I just had a hammer, then uh, it probably wouldn't have gotten built and look as pretty as it does right now. So yeah. so all, the, the more tools, the better. And I agree that the PRT, especially when it became available in the States, was a, it was a huge leap, leap forward, for at least for the patients that I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of PRT, John John says, can PRT be delivered via hepatic artery catheter? Great question, John. So this is being looked at. Yes, it certainly can. The Germans have been doing it for a long time. There, I think there was a trial at UCSF in San Francisco. I haven't seen the results. We're actually looking at a trial at Mayo for intra-arterial PRT. So for liver-directed uh, treatment, uh, liver sort of dominant disease, this actually may become yet another option. Mm -hmm. um, is there something, this is a follow-up question. This is from Katie who says, what makes the patient a good candidate for embolization over PRT in the case of predominantly, predominantly liver disease? So Katie, that's uh, another excellent question. So here, it's uh, what I, the way I look at it, I look at it as the, the tumor characteristics and the patient characteristics. Mm. So, uh, so sometimes the tumors just lend themselves super well to embolization. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes the blood vessels just are not the right for embolization. Sometimes uh, the patient would much rather have one embolization and not for PRRT treatments. And then uh, there are, uh, so, so everyone's a little different. So I, you have to take, sort of the, sort of take a step back and look at the big, big, big picture. And uh, sometimes these are equally good options. And you know, by the end of the day, you'll, you'll do them both. The question is, what are you gonna do first? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so Ashley says, Ashley has a small uh, eight millimeter net in the duodenum. Um, she's going in for the third time to have it removed endoscopically mm -hmm. um, and concerned that it may, it, you know, they may not be able to, to get it. And the doctor she's dealing with said it, it would, if not endoscopically, it would be major surgery to get this tiny tumor out. Are there any other options she asked other than a major surgery? So typically would be uh, would be endoscopic resection versus uh, major surgery. And the ma it, it is a major surgery. I'm not going to uh, to minimize that. Mm -hmm. This might be what's called, the question is where in the duodenum. And this could be a what's called a segmental or partial duodenectomy, where they just take that piece of the duodenum and put things together. But if it's near the pancreas, it might require what's called a Whipple resection, mm. so which is a much bigger surgery. So, uh, so I'd say endoscopic removal. Here, the key is to get the, an endoscopist who actually does a lot of complex endoscopic surgeries because their ability to remove things endoscopically is much better now than it was five years ago. But it requires expertise and special equipment. Radiation can sometimes be considered, but in the duodenum, typically not, because that could essentially just burn a hole in it. And um, so I think this would be a good uh, situation to meet with an endos uh, advanced endoscopist and the surgeon, talk about the risks and benefits of each uh, procedure, and then make a decision. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Jody says, I have high chromogranin and high serotonin. Is it time for a meeting with all my doctors, including cardiologists? So this, uh, assuming there is a known neuroendocrine tumor there. So if there's high serotonin, and especially if it's more than five times or, or five HIA or serotonin, more than five times the upper limit of normal, and even more than two or three times, it's time to get an echocardiogram. Carcinoid heart disease occurs in settings of high serotonin, and it is a sneaky disease. And uh, it sort of sneaks up on you, and you won't know it until your valves are in pretty bad shape. And so I like to get an echocardiogram and then I repeat it every one to two years. So uh, with a chromogranin is a troublesome marker. I'd say chromogranin is commonly used. It is not a very good marker. And, uh, and it goes up. Uh, I've seen chromogranin as high as 10,000 in someone on Prilosec. So it just tells you how high it can go. I have seen chromogranin 5,000 in someone with chronic benign inflammation of the stomach. And then we've seen a lot of people with very active tumors with normal chromogranin. So don't trust chromogranin. It's, it's a decent marker, but you have to look at the whole picture. Never look at chromogranin alone. Serotonin is different because that can actually damage your heart valves and cause the scarring in your abdomen. So usually if there's a really high serotonin, we got to do something about it. And we have a few options. 
and putting tablet stress test to lower it for cerebellum. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jody. Great question. Uh, next question from Wendy. Do non-peptide receptor positive patients have, have any hope? It's a yes. Broad... Okay. Yeah. Oh, excellent question, Wendy. So, so then the, the first question is when we say uh, receptor negative, what's that with an Octrio scan or the PET? A lot of the Octrio scan negative patients are actually PET positive. So, uh, but if there is truly no expression of somatostatin receptors, and we can test that by testing the tumor tissue, then you won't benefit from injections and you won't benefit from PRT. But we have Averolimus, we have Capetem, we have Sunetinib and similar drugs, even like Cabozantinib on a clinical trial you could do. So there's a, and embolization surgery, all of that. So there's a lot of hope for receptor negative patients too. Got it, got it. Let's see, folks, we got just a little bit more than 10 minutes left. So get your questions in. We have had great numbers that have sustained the whole program today. So that's exciting. It's probably because we have a great expert as our guest today. Thank you for joining us. There he is blushing again, folks. Uh, Kathy, <laughs> Kathy says, is PRT as effective with high grade nets? So here the main question is what's called the differentiation of the tumor. So mm -hmm. grade and differentiation are related, but not the same thing. So here's the rule of thumb. All poorly differentiated tumors are grade three. Mm -hmm. Not all grade three tumors are poorly differentiated. Sounds kind of complicated. It's so, like, like the square yeah. and the rectangle. Yeah, so, and yeah. So for the well differentiated high grade tumors, especially if key seven is less than 50 to 60, they actually may respond fairly well to PRT. And that's been shown by several studies in Europe. Poorly differentiated the tumors, the aggressive small cell, large cell, that sort of stuff, even if they have receptors, they don't respond well to PRT alone. I almost never do it, but that's actually where I would be really interested in looking at combinations with other drugs, PRT plus chemotherapy, PRT plus immunotherapy, PRT plus drug X, whatever that may be. So I don't think PRT, I think it may have a role in the future. Right now, poorly differentiated, high grade, no PRT, well differentiated, high grade, possibly PRT. Next question, we're plugging along from Lee says, can embolization fail so that liver progression is slightly worse? Not typical, well, it's, yeah. So it wouldn't necessarily worsen the progression that would happen anyway, but it just may not be effective. And that goes for all therapy. So no therapy except for maybe surgery is a, like guaranteed to produce a, a result sometimes the tumors are just getting blood, blood from other channels and it may fail for that reason. It's just, it didn't necessarily fail, it just didn't help. Got it. Katie says, uh, is CAPTEM therapy ever used more than once? For example, is if, uh, for example, there's a good response, but the treatment is stopped after a year prior to surgical treatment. Yeah, so Katie, that's, that's a really good question. So this is evolving. So we, a few years ago, I treated with Cape Tem sort of to best response, and then I continued it sometimes for years. And that's safe to do. And uh, But now there's a lot of interest in, and, and in part thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Reedy and Dr. Rash at, uh, at Memorial. So where we probably should consider treating with Cape Tem for only like nine to 12 months and then just stop. Hmm. And then... I have one, one patient where we did this and we stopped. And this is two years ago. The tumors really shrank and the tumors continued to shrink for another 12 months. No cape them, no therapy at all. And, uh, and then I'm, when they start growing again, eventually at some point, then I'll throw the cape them right back in because it worked the first time, hoping it worked the second time. So cape them beyond 12 months, probably not much benefit. And you can always go back on it if it worked before. If the tumors grew on Cape Tem, I would not go back to it. Got it. Margaret says, what are the options to lower serotonin? I recently had tumors debunked and no longer have flushing episodes, but my serotonin is still high. No metastasis uh, to the liver. Flushing was due to ovarian metastasis. Mm -hmm. So are there any options to help lower that serotonin? For yeah, Margaret? so the serotonin is, is tricky. So the serotonin test is tricky because it's very uh, 
sensitive to what you eat. So I'd much rather do a, a fasting plasma 5-HIAA, a blood test morning 5-HIAA. If that's persistently elevated, you're producing serotonin. So if there's nothing you can see and there's high serotonin that we think is coming from some tumors somewhere, even though you may not be able to see them, I actually think Cermelo or Telotristed is a very good choice. And it's a drug that directly targets the serotonin production. And then obviously octreotide or linoreotide, or if you can see something, go after it. And it has to be coming from somewhere, but some people just have, and this is one of the great puzzles in my clinic, the people with high serotonin and 5-HIA with no obvious tumors, where is that coming from? And, uh, and I wish I knew. Some people may be sort of genetically programmed to produce more serotonin than others. And the question is, is that coming from a tumor or is this just the way you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Thank you, doctor. And thank you, Margaret, for your question. Uh, question about managing symptoms from Kevin, who you may remember from the Chris Hemsworth and Hugh yeah. Grant comments. Uh, also, very interesting question from Kevin. Any thoughts on medical marijuana for carcinoid symptoms? And about five other people have, have, have liked that comment. So that's just something that, that many people are thinking about. Yeah, so not specifically to carcinoid tumors or carcinoid syndrome. And uh, it's a shame that we haven't studied the uh, marijuana or cannabis uh, as uh, um, a, a method to control symptoms. I, I think there's fairly good experience to say it helps with lack of appetite, weight loss, nausea, and may actually complement other like pain medications. So I, we have in Minnesota, there is medical cannabis and I often rec recommend this to patients with those symptoms. As for management of the carcinoid syndrome, I think we have a research idea here. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Kevin. You have been a delight to work with today with your comments. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yep, just shy of 10 minutes. We're going to keep pushing through. Doctor, appreciate your time so much. You've been excellent today. Sure. What, a, what a great guest. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself and learning and learning as well. Ashley says, what are the chances of nets coming back after removal? Is it common for them to spread and where would they most likely go? I'm 37. The oncologist I'm working with says, because I'm young, they will have to follow me for about 20 years. And I worry about having scans done every three years because of the radiation risk, which I know a lot of people share that concern. Um, so I know it's a big, broad question. So let's try to tackle it however you think is best. But her question is, what are the chances of nets coming back after removal? Is it common for them to spread and, and where most likely? Yeah, so outstanding question. So the, uh, the uh, determinants of risk of recurrence are, well, the tumor grade is probably the most important thing. The tumor size and the involvement of lymph nodes and whether there were metastases removed at the same time. So all of these sort of increase the risk. So, so uh, if you look, let's say if you look at sort of a, a small pancreatic neuron tumor, less than three centimeters with no lymph nodes, probably less than 10, less than 20% chance of that coming back after surgery. If you look at uh, uh, sort of higher grade pancreatic neuron tumors with multiple lymph nodes, there may be 60% chance of that coming back. So you have to look at all of these things and where it started, pancreas, small bowel, lung, lung neuron tumors, especially those that are well differentiated, rarely come back. And uh, so you look at all of those things and you, we need to follow people uh, probably beyond 10 years. I am using a lot more MRI than I ever did. Mm -hmm. MRI is just a giant magnet hooked up to a computer and there's no radiation. So MRIs are harmless, and, uh, but they take a long time and they're very loud. And uh, so, so I try to move over to, uh, to, uh, to uh, MRIs, whether new tests like net test and others will help in this regard actually is of great interest to me. And same thing with PET scans. We don't recommend routine PET scans in follow-up. We don't recommend routine net test in follow-up, but these are questions that have to be answered and have done, have been done to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think many people share your interest in the, in the net test. That's been really popular uh, in this show. We've talked about it a lot. There's always <clears throat> questions about it. Uh, so moving along with our last five minutes, Christopher says, if I have high blood serotonin, but not uh, high 5-HIAA, uh, uh, liver mets, is it worth taking steps beyond lanreotide? And in terms of symptoms, diarrhea and flushing are under control. Yeah. So if everything's under control and the serotonin is high, and then the question is, how was the serotonin collected? 
Was it done on a fasting sample? And the person who did it, how did they handle the specimen? So your platelets are packed with serotonin. If you take the tube and you shake it, you're going to get high serotonin. And if they sent it through a male tube system that in the hospital and just bump it around multiple different corners, you're going to get high serotonin. And uh, just because we mishandle, we sort of rough, rough handle the sample. And so I would do a, a fasting plasma serotonin and uh, uh, with carefully properly collecting the sample and see, is it really persistently elevated? So if the pi by j is normal, I'm a little, uh, I, I think that serotonin might, might actually not be of very little uh, importance. But if it's persistently high, we have lots of, we should, if no symptoms, probably we don't have to uh, treat it, but we would have to follow carefully for carcinoid heart disease and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sheila says, great program today. Really, We really appreciate the complexity of questions and answers. Very helpful. Sheila, absolutely. That's what we're here for. And I got to give a shout out to you all at home, the, the, the audience, the friends of the foundation. You're bringing it today. Great questions. Great questions. Uh, fortunately, we have an awesome expert on the show today to field those questions as well as he has. But yeah, I'm really proud of the, uh, of the, of the audience today. You guys have done a great job. Uh, Debbie says, impressions or thoughts on alpha therapy? Yeah, so alpha particle therapy is sort of the next generation PRT. Right. So it's a more powerful radionuclide that travels much shorter distance. Mm -hmm. So in theory, it could be more effective and less likely to cause leukemia. But so far, studies are very small, look promising. It's a, it's a, it's a compound that's very hard to get. There's not a lot of supply of our alpha particle uh, radiation emitters. But this, I think, is the could be the future of PRRT. So hopefully we and others will have alpha particle trials open in the next year or yeah. two. Great. So keep an eye on the alpha particles. I think that's really where the PRRT field may be going. Yeah, I've, I've heard that as well. Um, I'm by no means an expert, but I've, I've, I've talked to several doctors about that. Are, so question for me, are there other areas? We talked previously today about the um, significance of PRRT being available widely. <laughs> Uh, especially in the States for the past three years now. Um, are there things that, what would be the next? Is alpha therapy the next PRT? Is there something that will have as significant of an impact on the treatment of this disease as PRT that you see coming down the line? Even if it's a wish item or like if we could solve this riddle, we may be able to take those kinds of leaps and bounds. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like what? Yeah. What would be that opportunity? And it could be alpha therapy, but I've been wanting to ask that today. Yeah, so the uh, so great question. So the uh, so there are actually two parts to the PRT. Uh, so it's the the radioactive chemical, and then it is the compound that actually recognizes the tumor cells. So and then there is a glue that keeps the two together. And uh, so if we had something that bound better to more tumor cells, mm -hmm. we could actually make. Lutetium 177 works better. Mm -hmm. And that could possibly be compounds like JR11 or saturiotite, which is uh, probably going to be in clinical trials, I hope. Or it could be a new peptide to recognize, a new analog to recognize tumor cells and an alpha particle therapy. So these are the two moving parts in PRRT. So not just the radiations, also the, the thing that makes the radiation stick to the tumor cells. And then I think the other thing in the future of PRT, what should we be giving it with other drugs? So the Australians are doing a lot of chemo PRT, hmm. but the results are not that much better than with PRT alone or with chemotherapy alone. So I'm not sure if that's the solution. So Dr. Johan at the University of Kentucky has a really intriguing trial of PRT with a drug called triapine, which will open on select centers in the US, including at Mayo. That I think is where PRT should be going. So PR, what I call PRT plus. <laughs> I love it. Uh, finally, I, I have to mention this. Sherry says, this show has become a don't miss for me. I mean, so much. Appreciate the great guests like Dr. Half uh, and their willingness to educate us and so appreciative of CCF and Rain, even me uh, and the sponsors for giving us such a great learning avenue. Sherry, that, that means so much to us and it's exactly why we do it. And we love you all that come back every week. 
the messages that we get, which uh, Thor, we will we will send you uh, an email with some of these great messages because everybody's been very appreciative of how you've explained everything today, which is so key. It's not that you know the information; it's how you deliver it to people, and that's that's so that's so key and helpful to to people on this journey. So, uh, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you coming on the show. It's truly been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the for inviting me. And, Absolutely. Uh, always happy to share information. Yeah, I, I knew I'd have fun with you too. You, you did an awesome job and, and, and hopefully we can do it again. Uh, and thanks to you all at home for joining us as always. And we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. Again, a reminder, reach out to CCF if, if you have further questions or if we didn't get to your question, you can always message them here on their Facebook page or go to their website, carsonoid.org. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, Luncheon with the Experts would not be possible. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.